concentrating on Him and worshiping Him. He is worthy. Sing your song to him now. 
Lord, today we are, we are a week and a half into this new year. Lord, we're thankful for the grace that you've given, the faithfulness that you have shown yourself towards us over this past year. We know without a doubt we can trust you for that and more in the coming year. More grace, more mercy, more blessings, more help, more strength, more joy, more peace, more patience, more assurance, more motivation in ministry for this new year. We know that your grace is sufficient, past, present, and for 2021. We are thankful for that, Lord. We trust you fully for that. And so today our worship is, is a declaration of our faith. It's an expression of our trust in you all over again not that our circumstances govern but our faith in who you are in your faithfulness is what governs what governs our praises lord we thank you again lord for this day and we just want to declare from our hearts to your throne that jesus christ is lord if you haven't done that today, why don't you just do it in your heart? Do it out loud. Jesus Christ is Lord. Why don't you say it just with me? Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ, you are Lord. Jesus Christ, you are my Lord. You're our Lord. You reign. You rule supreme. And we gather today to exalt you in our hearts and in this church family. Lord, thank you so very, very much in Christ's name. A new song from an old verse. You're going to get it, I'm sure. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Here's how it goes. Listen up now.
you just sing as we worship the Lord, leaning on the everlasting arms. Saying he's just thankful he's COVID free, and uh, but uh, just pray for the medical personnel, uh, you know, nurses, doctors, aides, whoever is in the hospital. Uh, they're really getting stretched. Okay, there's no other praises. We'll go to prayer, Gordon. Before we, I go to prayer, I just want to mention that. Earlier this week, I was having my devotional time and thinking on all that's transpired in our country and 
kind of concerned and burdened about the situations as I've seen. And God just spoke to me so beautifully through a Christmas message. You know that story where, that scripture rather, that says, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, what is that word? Peace. Peace. Goodwill toward men. Peace. Glory to God. That's first that Jesus came to bring. Glory to his Father. And secondly, he came to bring peace to men. Now for this reason, a virus is not in control. Violence is not in control. The rules of men are not in control. Hallelujah. Jesus is in control. Amen. He's coming to bring us peace. Hallelujah. I love this. On earth, peace. His unbreakable peace released through those who choose to walk in it. I don't know about you, but I made a choice this week to walk in his peace. Hallelujah. Walk in his peace. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the peace of God that passes all understanding. Even in all the midst of the turmoil and strife that we see on every hand, we can walk in peace as the children of God. And we choose to do that today, Lord. We choose to do it. We want to say thank you, Lord. You've touched the great houses and able to be here today. We thank you, Lord. Just touch and continue to strengthen, continue to heal. And we'll thank you. Thank you that Don found a house. <laughs> oh, Lord, we've been praying and believing that you would provide the right place for him. You've done that. And we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We have many in our church, Lord, that are dealing with this COVID. Several families. We're asking, O oh Lord, that you would minister in a very special way to these that are dealing with this at this time. Bring strength. Bring healing. And Lord, we'll thank you in advance for all that you do. We rejoice, Lord, that many are already feeling better. And we give you praise and honor and glory. We want to pray for our medical personnel. Many are being overtaxed and overworked and, what, and willingly stepping right into the situation where the virus seems to be so great. We pray, Lord, that you would keep them from the virus, touch them, strengthen them, and help them at this very difficult time. We want to pray for the Meadville Pregnancy Center and especially for Kay, that, Lord, you would visit her with that healing touch that she needs at this time. Oh, God, we pray that you would minister. If ever we need this center going now, it's now. We've had individuals in our government say that when they get into power, our tax dollars are going to pay for abortions. Oh, God, we don't want this, but we're just laying it all before you and trusting you, God, to minister. Use our Maidville Pregnancy Center and work in a very special way. We want to remember our pastor's niece's husband, Ivan, in prayer. Oh, Lord, he's on life support, and he's an atheist. Oh, God, while he lays there in that hospital, Make yourself real to him, we pray. And might through this experience, I even come to know you as his personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for working. And thank you for ministering and meeting this need. Lord, would you be with Rachel and Bart as they begin this new outreach in the Pittsburgh area. Direct and guide their lives 
lead them to the ministry that you want them to have there, and we're thanking you in advance. We pray, Lord, for our nation. We need a revival in our nation. Oh God, we pray that you would break it through in a very special way. We just have to lay it all before you. We pray for our President Trump and Vice President Pence. We pray for the Bidens and Kamala Harris and her family. We are asking God that you would minister and you would work in a very special way. We don't hold the answer, but you do. And we walk in that peace and comfort and assurance that you're in control and you will work in a very special way. We'll not fail to give you the praise, the honor, and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. back and Samantha. Good to see you guys. Dakota, just to, just to share this, Dakota, whenever she's been here in the past and she's often with uh, Ted and Janelle and they'll be in the office and, and uh, doing some things and Dakota will just get right at the, the secretary's uh, desk and she'll just 
gets on the computer and just does all this stuff and just is very busy and I'll ask her to make some copies and she'll come and go like this, here are your copies and all of these things and so she came, it's been a few weeks, I don't know how long it's been, but she, a few weeks and they were here this morning and I came in and there was Dakota on the office keyboard on the computer just busy preparing something for Pastor Jeff, I'm not sure what it was, but but uh, what, a, what a treasure you both are. And some things have come through down there for your house, and we're thankful for that. That's another uh, answer to prayer. Matthew chapter 6, Sermon on the Mount. We continue to go through the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has brought up the issue of anxiety that uh, he is addressing in this passage. And so we've been focusing on anxiety uh, the last, uh, since the Sunday before Christmas, I believe it was. And um, we looked at the problem of anxiety. We looked at the prescription of anxiety. We will eventually get to the promise through anxiety that Jesus gives us. But um, so I, before I, 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 found, I discovered this recently, and this is from the Canadian Medical Association, uh, and it's about anxiety. And, I, and I'm not one to make light of someone who has anxiety, but we're going to make a little bit light of it this morning, okay? But this is from um, Canadian Medical Association, and this is. I'm not sure why they did this, but a bit of a tongue-in-cheek kind of take on Winnie the Pooh, Christopher Robbins in the Hundred Acre Woods, and the various mental disorders that all these people have. Winnie the Pooh shows evidence of signs of impulsive eating disorder. His near obsession with honey indicates an eating disorder and his habit of repetitive counting shows obsessive compulsive, dis, uh, self, obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Poor Winnie. Piglet. Piglet, and, and that's kind of, his, he's our focus today, or, or she, whoever Piglet is. Piglet is, is diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. Piglet is in a perpetual state of worry and can often be heard saying, oh dear, oh dear. He also has developed a, an ear twitch commonly common in overly anxious individuals. Right? <laughs> then there's Eeyore. Is he anybody else's favorite? Eeyore, you guessed it, depressive disorder. He always has a bleak outlook on life, never feels any positive emotion like happiness or excitement. Rabbit, obsessive compulsive disorder. Rabbit is very orderly and obsessive, mostly with regard to his garden. Then there is Owl, suffers from dyslexia and narcissistic personality disorder. He's got a double dose. While he is exceptionally bright, he's frequently shown that Owl has trouble reading. An example would be in Pooh's Grand Adventure when he mistakes the word school for skull. There are other examples. Owl also uh, is also theorized to have narcissism, an inflated sense of self-importance due to his belief that he is wiser than all the others. And then there's Tigger with the intention deficit hyperactive disorder, 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 disorder. Tigger is always seen bouncing and can never stay in one place for a very long period of time. And then Kanga. Kanga is believed to suffer from social anxiety disorder. This is the mother kangaroo, if you recall. She's very overprotective of her son and she would never allow him to make his own decisions because of her overprotectiveness. Her son's name is Rue. Rue suffers from autism spectrum disorder. 
He lacks awareness of danger and has a strange attachment to sitting in his mother's pouch. And then there's Christopher Robin. You'll never read Winnie the Pooh again after this. This just like blew my mind. Christopher Robin suffers from schizophrenia because it's believed that all the talking animal characters above are merely manifested depending on Christopher Robin's mood. Oh no. There's the hint that Winnie the Pooh doesn't even exist. So I don't know. I don't know if you're going to recover from that or not, but I thought those were just some interesting uh, takes from the Medical Association regarding anxiety and some things that uh, some of us deal with. But we're looking at anxiety uh, today in this. Anxiety is not necessarily mental disorder, by the way, but can certainly become a thief of hope, a thief of peace, a thief of our Christian motivation for service. And church, today, we live in an anxiety-rich environment. Amen? We live in an anxiety-rich environment. These are anxious times indeed, as Reverend Bean pointed out earlier. Matthew chapter 6, we'll start reading in verse 25 and read through our uh, verse 30 for today. Matthew 6, 25 through 30, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So we began looking at the problem of anxiety a couple of weeks ago. And two of the problems regarding anxiety. Number one, the problem with anxiety is that anxiety is a thief. He comes in and seeks to steal our hope, our joy, our encouragement, our patience, our peace, even erode our faith. Second problem with anxiety is that he never acts alone. As soon as anxiety makes his way into your life, he opens that door, he cracks that door, and he immediately gets on the phone, calls up backup. He calls up fear, despair, anguish, consternation, apprehension, all those things that we were looked at a couple of weeks ago for two weeks. All of these, all of his associates, and he says, come on in, it's easy pickings. Then they come in and loot and pillage our life of all the good things and blessings that God wants to instill in our life. And if you've ever suffered from anxiety, you know what I'm talking about. And so in this, we're focusing on faith questions for a favorable future that Jesus asks. He asks these series of questions that we've been looking at several of them so far. And then Jesus just doesn't identify the problem of anxiety. He gives us prescription for anxiety. And last week we looked at the remedy, remedy number one, and this remedy came with an assignment last week. Remedy number one, Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? Faith question number one was, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The sum total of your life, of your existence, is it not more than that? 
And the question that Jesus was looking for is, yes, Jesus, obviously so. You hit the nail on the head. Do I live it out? No. Am I guilty of being anxious for lots of things? Yes. But Jesus, you nailed it. Exactly right. Yes, that's right. That's the answer he's looking for. Total agreement with that answer to that question. And so Jesus gives, gives us the remedy to look at the birds of the air. They don't worry. They don't sow. We don't think they do anyway. We don't think they worry. But yet they have all that they need. And basically what they do is they just enjoy the faithfulness of God as he provides for them food, seeds, worms, insects. may not sound like a very good menu to you, but they love it. The birds love it. And they appreciate it. And so God provides for them. And our assignment last week was for us this week to become bird watchers. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I urge you to go home and stock up those bird feeders and spend extra time at the dinner table or wherever you can look out and see that, uh, that bird feeder or that bird bath or wherever the birds gather and just watch them. And as you watch them, not just thinking about how pretty they sound or how colorful they are, but watch them and think my, how God's faithfulness is taking care of their every need. Am not I more important than they? Yes, I am. That was your assignment this week. I hope it was. Because anxiety, this is a remedy for anxiety. And anxiety, we want to take a pill so it'll be over. We want to flip a switch so it will be done. But it just doesn't happen that way. Anxiety doesn't come on with the flip of a switch doesn't come on like that. It seeps in, it oozes in, and little by little kind of consume, can consume our life. And so Jesus gives us these remedies. If we can just spend time looking, paying attention to how God provides for even what we would consider to be insignificant birds, sparrows. They were a dime a dozen, if not cheaper, in Jesus' day. And yet one would fall from the ground and Jesus said, oh, by the way, heaven just noticed that. <laughs> I, know, I know that that bird just fell to the ground. I got the solar systems going. I got your life under control. But yes, I saw that. I knew that. Didn't escape my sovereign care or my notice. So we're to learn those things from Jesus. And faith question number two was, are not you more important than they are? And as Jesus gives these questions, these just aren't questions to hear himself self-talk. I believe that he expects the readers and the people that he was preaching to, the crowds of people that he was preaching to, I believe he was wanting them to think about this question, to ask this question, and to answer this question, and to come up with these answers, yes, Lord, Obviously, I am more important than they are. Yes, Lord, you are. You will take care of me. Yes, Lord, my life, my existence is more important than what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to wear, what, what I'm going to do today. It's, it's greater than that. It's on a grander scale than that. And yes, Lord, I, I realize that. That's what he wants us to, I believe, say and express and embrace those so faith, faith question number three. Faith question number three, if you're writing these down, and I hope you are, is why are you anxious about clothing? Why are you anxious about clothing? Anybody here anxious about your clothing? What if we woke up this morning? I just thought this would be a colossal joke to play on somebody sometime. You wake up while your spouse or somebody is sleeping, you just take all her clothes out, all those nice shoes that she had and, and all those nice sweaters and dresses or take your husband's stuff out and replace it with 70s clothing, bell bottoms, uh, wide lapel double knit suits, uh, all of this stuff and then wake up in the morning. Talk about an anxiety attack. You know, what planet did I wake up on? 70-ish, 70-ish clothing. Some of you kids don't even know what we're talking about. 
The rest of us are laughing it up. We're yucking it up. We know exactly what's going on. You're like, so what? I don't know what you're talking about. Just Google it. Google it. Hey, Siri, give me some, give me some 70 attire. Yeah, you'll get a good laugh out of that. Hairdos. Oh, my goodness gracious. Wish we could erase that decade, right? Why are you anxious about your clothing? I think this one is sort of a step up. The food was our basic necessity. Clothing is too. But it's one thing to be worried about being unfed. It's another thing to worry about being unclothed. Most of us didn't wake up. We've, we've never had the fear. We've never been anxious of being unclothed, probably. Maybe you've been anxious about being unstylish, but not unclothed. At least we aren't. I've never felt that. I never woke up in the morning and think, I don't have anything to wear. Oh, but people say that. Oh, I don't have a thing to wear. Sure you do. You just can't make up your mind which thing to put on. That's, that's the problem. It's not that you're unclothed or, or don't have anything to wear. You just don't know what your preference for that day is. You can't make up your mind. And so when Jesus gets this, he says, he says, don't be anxious for anything. Why are you anxious about clothing? And while worries about our basic needs, our basic necessities are understandable, Remember, worries are based on true or false. Reality, false. Worries are based on apparent possibilities, true. Something that we don't even know if it's going to happen or not, but we worry about it. We're anxious about it. Increased stress over, am I going to wake up and have a closet full of 70s clothes? Most of us don't have that worry. But it's a, an apparent possibility. Not likely, but it could happen. So be, do not be anxious. And the word again is do not be distracted. Remember the smoke screen analogy? A smoke screen doesn't really do damage or a smoke bomb doesn't do damage. It just causes mayhem and hysteria. It's a distraction. It makes you think something's going on when really, when really it's not. And that's kind of what anxiety does. It's like a smoke screen. It gets us uncertain about events. And for some people, it's affected more, more so than others. Some can have a smoke screen and get over it uh, sooner than others. Some can be anxious and get over it easier sooner than others. For some, anxiety gets in and builds and builds and becomes worse and more life-consuming, more, more vision-altering, vision-blurring, more life-changing. And so Jesus, I think it's a great topic. Why he picked just anxiety? I don't know. These other mental disorders, not that anxiety is always a mental disorder, but he picks anxiety. And we'll get a little bit later to why I think Jesus picked anxiety. But Jesus talks about anxiety. And again, anxiety is not a reality, not based on fact or reality, but on apparent possibilities. So it can arise from genuine positive care. And when we become anxious about something, it's because... We're concerned about something that's important to us. So there's something good behind anxiety. If you didn't care about anything or anybody, you'd never be anxious. Oh, I don't care if my family's safe or healthy or not. Therefore, I never get anxious about it. But I do care about my family. And I do get anxious about the COVID things. And I get anxious personally. My wife works on the COVID floor and they're jam-packed. And there's several net nurses are out right now. Uh, in isolation and in quarantine and other nurses are having to kind of fill in the gaps and we keep wondering, well, I, I hope Faith doesn't have a symptom or, you know, or I hope she doesn't get sick because she's right there. So you were concerned about things and because of our concern, we can get, we can get anxious over the safety of others or the state of our nation. Like Reverend Beam 
brought up. So we have learned that our concern over food may be concern about a basic necessity, while our focus or concern on clothing may be more of a preference or a style. Are we hoping to keep up with others? Why are you concerned about your clothing? Why do you get up in the morning and worry if you have a green sweater with plaid pants or if one shoe matches the other one? We just don't like to look like a bozo. I mean, it's, we have an image. You know, we want to, every one of us has an image that we try to present. Whether you think you do or not, we are kind of, we, 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 we present it. That's why we choose the clothing we do. That's why we dress the way we do. It may not be fancy, but we all kind of have a, a style we like and feel more comfortable dressing. So why are you anxious about clothing? I can't answer that one for you. You and I have to answer that question. But why are we anxious about what we put on? Why are we anxious about our clothing? And then there's the question, there's the faith question for a more favorable future. If we can ask that and allow God to help us to answer that, come to grips with that, then we're on the, on the way to chipping away at the thief of anxiety that may has had kind of taken up residence in our life. And again, anxiety is a little bit like body odor. People with body odor often say, I don't have body odor, but those around them think, oh yes you do. And some of us might think, oh I don't, I don't suffer from anxiety. But those around you may think, oh yes you do. You may not think you do, but you do. Now, when I'm anxious, I know there are certain things that, that I do and goofs my family up and causes problems. But when we're anxious, you know, people around us, around us know it. Why are you anxious about what you're going to wear? You and I need to come to that answer. But Jesus gives us another remedy. Here's remedy number two. Remedy number one was to look. Look at the birds of the air. Look at what they're not doing. And notice how God, the faithful creator, demonstrates his faithfulness in caring and providing for them. Now he says in verse 28, Why are you anxious about clothing? Here's the remedy number two. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of them. Look at the birds of the air. Now consider the lilies of the field. Do you think flowers ever complain? Why'd you make me pink? I want to be purple like that, like hair over there. Why do I smell like a rose? I'd rather smell like a daffodil. Why'd you give me this when I, when, you know, why do I have a thorn when they got like a smooth steam? All these things, do you think they do that? Jesus, I mean, it sounds sarcastic when you say it out loud, doesn't it? I don't know if the people during Jesus' time says, why is he being so sarcastic? But it's what Jesus says. Look at the lilies of the field. They don't, they don't spin. You don't see them in their little sewing machine. And sewing and needle and thread and patchwork and grabbing this leaf and that petal and this dye and everything else and perfume. They just grow. Flowers are just uh, the end result of God's creative generosity towards nature. And we benefit from it. They don't complain. They don't work long hours. That's what Jesus is saying. And yet, the lilies of the field are arrayed or they are clothed more gloriously than, guess who? King Solomon may have been the wealthiest man to ever live, at least at, one, at that time. Not even Solomon is arrayed in such splendor. And these lilies of the field, it's interesting, that it doesn't say lilies of the lily garden, as though there would be a gardener assigned to manage this garden full of lilies. 
And so the gardener has this miracle grow lily, lily food, I guess, or whatever it was, and the gardener is responsible for that. These are not the lilies of the garden. These are the lilies of the field. The idea that these were just wildflowers that kind of sprung up around the countryside that were beautiful, that were seasonal, and they weren't there because somebody planted them, but because this is where God put it, where God developed them, and it was the handiwork of God. So he says, consider the lilies of the field. Think about that. That word consider is the word that means it has to do with putting your mind in action. It's not just looking and noticing, but it's looking, noticing, and then stopping right there and musing or meditating on something. It means to think carefully, examine thoroughly, and to learn it completely. There's a lesson to be learned. We, we look, we think, we engage, we examine, and we learn from it. We learn a lesson from it, and that's what Jesus is trying to give us a lesson a lesson that we all need to learn about God's faithfulness. No gardener puts those lilies out there, but it's, again, like the birds being fed, the flowers of the field, the wild flowers of the field are evidence of God's faithfulness and blessing. I love wild flowers. If you ever come by our house during the summer after I've cut the grass, You would be the one to laugh at me. <laughs> Some of you know what's going on here. It's funny. The beings love a nice, clean, immaculate garden, and, and it's beautiful. There's no doubt about it. But the most beautiful lawn in town is ours. And because I when I when I cut the grass, I mow around the wildflowers. Because we have the the yellow um, dandelion wildflowers. We have the little, I guess, are African purple, African fly, uh, violets that kind of real, real low to the ground. And then we have these little pockets of white. I don't know what they are. They're little tiny, dainty things. But they're like little patches of those. And and I get most of the yard, but I do go around those things because I like to leave the the you know the wildflowers. I think they're beautiful. God put them there. And I enjoy looking at it. People laugh. People laugh when they look at my yard. And I understand. I don't hold that against you. But I do love, uh, I love a nice clean yard, but I do love a yard even more so with, with wild flowers because didn't, we didn't plant them. But just, they're just beautiful. Here at the church, the slope going up in the basketball courts, coming down that little slope, that is just like a yellow, the right time, that's just like a, a yellow blanket and with just a, like a little sprinkling of purple, almost a hue of purple, which is those little violets that are everywhere. And it's just, it's just beautiful. I just, uh, I'm just a wildflower uh, kind of guy. So Jesus tells us to look at these things. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. All of it is evidence of God's faithfulness. And are you not more valuable than they are? And the question he asks is intended to bring about the answer in our minds, yes, Lord, I am far more valuable than those birds. I am far more valuable than the lilies of the field. You are just as faithful to me, if not more so, than the birds and the flowers. And that's what God wants us to come to grips with, and that's why this is a remedy. It's not a pill, not a shot, not a switch, but over time, as we begin to think about God's faithfulness in nature and how much greater value we are than that, that's designed. That remedy is given to us to eat away at anxiety, to eat away at all of his associates that he brings into our life that is looting and pillaging our hope, our peace, our joy, our patience, our motivation for ministry, 
Anxiety will just eat it all away. You'll steal it all. So faith question number four, verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you little faith? The answer, oh yes, he will. Will he not clothe you? Oh yes, he will. Will he not provide for you? Oh yes, he will. Will he not come to your rescue? Oh yes, he will. Will he not show himself just as faithful in your situation? Oh yes, he will. Church, oh yes, he will. Christians in America, oh yes, he will. Will 2021 be potentially the best year ever? Oh, yes, it will. Because I choose that, what you gave us this morning. I choose that. I can choose, we can choose to waller in our complaining, allow the news to fill our hearts, minds, and, and, and putrefy us, or we can choose to walk in the blessings that God already has for us. As far as I'm concerned, the devil can't take it away unless we resign it over to him. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he will. Oh, yes, he will. I want to ask you today, I don't know of a better way to get peace than for the Prince of Peace to come in and fill your heart and life. The Bible says Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's the God of Peace. He's the Lord of Peace. And when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we tend to think He stands on another planet somewhere, or He's in heaven, and He says, "Okay, here's a here's a here's um, here's a little bit of a uh, bit of hope, or here's a little bit of peace, and I'm sending it." It'll get there sometime. I'm sending it. You know, here, here it comes. Look for it. Or here's a little bit of joy. Here it comes. He doesn't do that. Because when we trust Christ, the Bible says we receive him. John chapter 1 says we receive the person of Jesus Christ. And so when we receive Jesus, when he comes into our life, guess what? He brings all that he is. He brings all that he is, people. He doesn't just leave, leave his peace in heaven and comes and says, okay, here I am. Not much help to you because I left your joy in heaven. Sorry about that. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, he brings in all that he has to offer. And so this peace that he's talking about, guess where it is? You already got it. We already have it. In full measure, we can never have more peace than what we already have. We may not feel like it. We may not be experiencing it. But Jesus gives us the remedy. Look at the birds. Notice God's faithfulness. That should instill peace in our life. Look at the lilies of the field. There's nobody on planet Earth ever been clothed more beautifully than God's own own wildflowers are not you more valuable than they are. Will I not come to your rescue as I've come to the rescue of all of the rest of creation? Here, here's, here's my peace. Take it. Focus on it. Let it fill your life. Let it fill your life. I want to ask you today, is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Is he the God of peace? If your life needs peace, Maybe you need to surrender to Jesus. Maybe Jesus is not your Lord or your Savior. And you're going about life and, you know, things aren't too rocky. Things could be better, but, you know, nothing, no, no crisis going on. God has joy. He has peace. He has salvation. He has forgiveness. He has an eternal place that he's prepared just for you. Through faith in him. Lord, I want to pray for each person here today, Lord. Thank you for the peace that you bring. You don't send it 
I don't even think you give it, you bring it. And thank you, Lord, that as we trust in you, you come in, you've promised to come in and fill our hearts and fill our lives and to change us from the inside out and even to take away the anxiety that we struggle with, that robs us, that loots us, that pillages all of our peace, hope, love, joy, patience, motivation, so that we get so stinking focused on ourselves, We over-exaggerate our difficulties. Lord, forgive us for that. Help us to reach out and take this remedy, these remedies for anxiety. Bless us to genuinely think about these faith questions for a favorable future that you want us to have right now and answer these questions. Come to grips with these questions. Embrace the answers to these questions and experience fully the peace and joy that you have for each of us. Forgive us for being so anxious. Forgive us for allowing anxious to dwell and take up residence, to steal, loot, and pillage, and bring in all of his other associates. Lord, I pray that if there are people here today that are overly anxious with increasing stress, increasing anxiety, increasing paralysis of life. Lord, I pray today that they would be trusting in you, Lord Jesus, inviting you to take up residence and, and fill your, their hearts and lives with your peace, to purge out this thief of anxiety and all of his backup. Lord, I'm asking you to just make a dramatic change in some of our lives here today. And we'll thank you for it, Lord. We thank you and we love you. Holy Father, it is so sweet to be able to trust in you, Lord Jesus. So wonderful to have the assurance that all the things that we need, our Father in heaven knows and provides. In Christ's name, amen.